Hello, I'm George C. Scott. It's my happy job this evening to give you an improvisational introduction to the Andersonville Trial, a play by Saul Levitt. I did it 10 years ago on Broadway as an actor, and uh, I've directed it here for you tonight. Um, I don't know how good it is as far as the directing assignment goes, but you're going to have to be the judge of that. The cast is splendid. Uh, the play is wonderful. It means uh, a great deal to me, and I think it, it can mean uh, something to you uh, contemporaneously. It takes place a hundred years ago, but uh, what it says and what it means, I think uh, you'll understand, and I sincerely hope you'll enjoy it. And so, the Anderson Bill. Move to deny defense motion as to that deadline, in that it was clearly part of the code. Inhuman design of that cat. Inhuman. Yes. Immoral. Yes, I can. Well, a judge advocate openly and finally admit his belief that Captain Wirtz's duty was a moral and not a military choice. A human choice. This arguing over an irrelevant issue becomes intolerable. Parties are won. Defense motion is denied. Now. Will the judge advocate state the connection between the moral issue and the charge of conspiracy? A judge advocate will not attempt to make that connection. Thank you, Mr. Culver. You may stand down. Well, if the uh, judge advocate has concluded, we'll adjourn until tomorrow, at which time the defense will be ready. We may wish to ask for further witnesses. If so, there'll be witnesses bringing in new criminal evidence. I say new criminal evidence in the precise legal meaning of that term, bearing directly on the charge of conspiracy. I hope that's understood, Colonel. Yes, sir. This court's a joke. Tell me, Colonel, how does your role in this room differ from Wurtz's at Andersonville? compare me to him? You know in your heart you condemn him for carrying out the orders of his military superiors. But this court will have no part of that argument. And what then do you do but withdraw it? You obey as Wirtz obeyed. Compare me to him? Oh, of course, you're governed by much purer motives. Let's forget about the fact that you're in a position to walk out of this case the envy of every young struggling lawyer in the country. The successful prosecutor of the one war criminal to be hanged out of this war. Your career is assured if you don't jeopardize it. Shall then the government's own counsel go out and preach disobedience to orders? <laughs> How's it feel to be an instrument of policy and nothing more? God damn you. Get as angry as you wish. But that's the truth of it. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You see what he's trying to do? I see. He's trying to provoke you. I know. I shout at you. I shout at Davidson. Only a boy, a sick boy. Well, where do we stand after days of witnesses on the stand? 
Sick, broken survivors of that place. We haven't proven criminal acts. What kind of a case do we bring in here? Well, if uh, you want a better one... Uh... Close with Gray. He saw Wirtz commit murder. You heard Gray. Do you believe him? Let the court decide. Gray furnishes the name of the murdered man. His name? Regiment. What's the difference in the end, Shipman? Wirtz is doomed anyway. The kind of case we bring in doesn't really matter. Does it? Oh. No, really. And if we believe that Wirtz should have disobeyed to save those men, hmm, we're afraid to raise the issue. Baker has reached you. But are we any better than he was at Andersonville? Or has Baker raised an issue that's been in this case from the beginning? One that we haven't wanted to face. We don't need to face it. I'll say it again. What is doomed? No matter how our case looks, now you can make it hard for yourself if you want to by turning it the wrong way. But you're a soldier, Chipman, and you know how this army has to function if it functions at all. Has ways of dealing with irregulars. You seem to want to go a hard way. <laughs> I want to go a hard way. This blood spattered country. Skulls bleaching in the s under the sky. The dead of my own Iowa second. Names you wouldn't know. Did any of us want to go a hard way? But we did. We did. As if we had any choice. As if I have any choice here. I asked for this case feeling hard against them. Hating them enough to want to flog them to words. Do you think I want to shed that hatred? Understanding what Baker wants me to do, to lock me in a quarrel with this government. I can't go around that. I hate that damn Southern cause. I still can't go around that issue. I'm partisan to my bones, and I still can't go around what Baker says. I'd like to believe that I'm more of a man than Wirtz was, that I would have disobeyed to save those men. But am I more of a man than he was? Either I press the court to consider the issue of Wirtz's moral responsibility to disobey, or I'm no better in my mind than he was, and I can't go around that. Just how would you raise your moral issue? I don't know. Get Baker to put words on the stand. Which he won't do. Put Gray on. You don't have to like him. Put Gray on the stand. Neil is case done with a clear statement of murder, and you have your man, even if it isn't in your way. The government has a point to make too, you know. It struggles to pull together a divided country. Now, isn't that a worthy, an important thing? <laughs> At least as important as the purity of your soul. Hosmer. Larger issues than a man's own convictions, aren't they? Sometimes. You make me feel old.
education. Professing religion as you do, will you agree that the promptings of conscience, moral considerations, are primary to all men? Of course I do. I observe that I deal like most men when I can. Wait a minute, and you could not observe moral considerations at Andersonville. That situation was General Winder's responsibility, not mine. Uh, this was General Winder's responsibility because he was your military superior? Yes, sir. How far over you did you deem his authority to extend? To all circumstances, considering that was a military war situation. To all circumstances, you're certain of that? I am absolutely certain. And had General Winder in this military war situation given you a direct order to slaughter one of your own children without an explanation, would you have done it? <laughs> it is ridiculous. Would you have done it? <laughs> it is ridiculous. Yeah, would you have done it? Answer, no. Why not? It would have been an insane order. Yes, insane, or inhuman, or immoral. And the man does indeed, therefore, in his heart, make some inner judgment as to the orders he obeyed. Well, the judge advocate will hold. This court has stated more than once it is not disposed to consider the moral issue relating to soldierly conduct. It has indicated to the judge advocate that we are on extremely delicate ground at any time that we enter into the circumstances under which officers may disobey their military superiors. However, the Judge Advocate apparently now feels he must enter that area. He will furnish some legal basis to this court, or he will withdraw this line of question. If the court please, I will the endeavor to... The Judge Advocate must furnish a legal basis. The Judge Advocate respectfully... This court will hear a basis for permitting this line of inquiry. The court please. Military courts, judging war crimes, are governed by both the criminal code and a broader, more general code of universal international law. In most cases that come before them, they will judge the specific acts in which the nature and the degree of offense is determinable without great difficulty. But on rare occasions, cases occur demanding from the court a more, a more searching inquiry. And should the court allow that broader inquiry, it becomes more than just a court of record on a particular case. It becomes a supreme tribunal willing to peer into the very heart of human conduct. The judge advocate respectfully urges that the court does not in advance limit or narrowly define the basis of questioning should the court insist on such a basis. We are through with the witness. Well, does the uh, judge advocate offer this court alternatives? Oh, no, sir, we did not mean to imply that. You know, you know we are very flattered to think that uh, we may take on the mantle of a, a supreme tribunal. However, it is still a military court. If the court please. No, Colonel, I'm not through. Now, the court grants that, that it may be philosophically true that men have the human right to judge the commands of their military superiors. But, Colonel, in practice, one does so at his peril. At his peril, yes, sir. And we would want that the peril of that line of question, that it be clearly understood, most clearly. Now, we have a question for the judge advocate, which he may or may not answer, since he, of course, is not on trial here. The question is, what is it an honest man fights for? when he takes up arms for his country? Is it the state or the moral principle inherent in that state? And if the state and the principle are not one, is he bound not to fight for that state and indeed to fight against it? Now, the judge advocate needs an answer. We'll, we'll make the question more particular. <clears throat> if, if at the outbreak of the war, the government of the so-called Confederacy had stood on the moral principle of freedom for the black man, and the government of the United States had stood for slavery, would a man have been bound on moral grounds to follow the dictates of conscience, even, even if it had led him up to the point of taking up arms against the government of the United States? That's inconceivable. That's not the question. Well, such a situation and and that possible. is not the question. He would be bound to follow the dictates of his own conscience. Colonel, e even to the point of taking up arms against the government of the United States? Yes, sir. Ah. Well, 
The Colonel understands, of course, that a man must be prepared to pay the penalties involved for violating the, uh, well, let us say, the code or the group to which he belongs. Now, in other societies, that has meant death. In our society, it can merely mean deprivation of status, uh, contempt of his fellows, exile in the midst of his countrymen. Uh, well, I take it the Colonel understands my meaning. He understands what the court is saying. And you still feel? He still feels that he must enter this most dangerous area. General, I do not enter on my own free will. I, I enter because I'm forced to it by the very nature of this case. We have lately emerged from a terrible and bloody war, and this war has spawned a very curious and sinister crime. Men in the thousands, 14,000 men have been sent to their death, not by bullets on the battlefield, but in a subtle, hidden, furtive fashion. We have, through the course of this trial, examined, as it were, the outward appearances of hell. The walls, the stockade, the swamps, the dogs, the terrible heat, the freezing cold, and, and we have not gotten to the heart of it. We are now faced with the necessity of exploring further into, let us say it again, hell. I put it to the court that we owe to those 14,000 men who died, to those who mourn them, something so true as to put us head and shoulders above politics, above sectionalism, above the bitterness in our own heart. I admit to entering this room with that bitterness in myself. I admit to that mood of vengeance. I wish... I wish... now to go... Beyond that, if I can. As we say, life is precious, and as we cling to our humanity by our fingernails in this world, <coughs> by our fingernails, let us have a human victory in this room. Colonel, the court is not unmoved. <clears throat> the <clears throat> judge advocate feels, considers, he feels it's primary to the presentation of his case, the moral issue of disobedience to a superior officer. Yes, sir. You may continue. Judge Advocate may continue. The judge Advocate may continue? Yes! Defense counsel is amazed that this court does not now recognize the fact that there is no legal case here to try to connect normal obedience to orders with willful conspiracy is impossible. And no fine-sounding statements of Universal law or supreme tribunal can break the unbridgeable. And the court knows that the judge advocate cannot possibly make that connection. Yet the court allows the judge advocate to proceed when it should forthwith dismiss the defendant. Are you, Mr. Baker, ordering the court to do that? No. But he submits that there is no legal case here. The judge advocate may continue! And this court will decide when it will conclude that question when nothing more can be gained by it. Is that clear? Digging in this hopeless effort to escape, digging, crawling like rats. Like rats. And rats may die, and one may have no compunction about rats. Yes. Oh, no, 
Ah, no. I meant rat so to speak. You, you, you are playing a cheap lawyer's trick on me. Very well, a cheap lawyer's trick, so they were not rats to you. But they were no longer men to you. In your mind, you had canceled them out as men, made them less than men. Then they might die. And one need not suffer over that. Why did you try to commit suicide in your cell? Was it because you feel nothing? Was it because you feel nothing as a human being and cannot endure yourself feeling nothing? You speak too much of your children. Is it because you've already asked them in your mind, should I have done my duty? Or should I have given the man a drink of water? And you have already heard their answer. <laughs> oh. You wish to die. I ask you for the last time, Mr. Words, why? And it was not fear of dismissal or court martial or any external thing. Why? Inside yourself, couldn't you disobey? Simply, I could not. I did not have that feeling inside myself to, 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 to do that. I did not have that feeling of strength. Be able to. I could not disobey. Well, I'll say this for you, Colonel. At least you fought on your own terms. I asked for his guilt, not his death. And he dies anyway. This is life of the Union dead. Political verdict. I charged him for what he is. And who cares? I did. What's that got to do with the real world? Men will go on, most of them, subject to fears, and so subject to powers and authorities. How do we change that slavery? Well, it's of man's very nature. Is it? We try to redecorate the beast in all sorts of political coats, hoping that we will change him. But is he to be changed? I don't know. We try. <laughs> 